subject this morning is William Wordsworth's two-part prelude uh, as by way of an introduction to our uh, main focus throughout this course, which is on the Romantic epic or uh, variously uh, Milton and the Romantics, because as I said at the outset, one of the things that is going to preoccupy us uh, in addition to the epic works that the Romantics themselves wrote, is the influence of the man Milton and Milton's themes, uh, and even his style of writing on the poets of the age. And we're beginning with Wordsworth because Wordsworth is the greatest poet of the age. I will uh, expand on that in a minute. Um, but he was thought so by his uh, great friend but also critic Samuel Taylor Coleridge in his uh, own great critical work, the Biographia Literaria, uh, placing Wordsworth only uh, after Milton in his esteem as one of the great poets of the English language. And it's largely because of the uh, diction as well as the subject matter of his poetry. And uh, I would say even now, reading and rereading Wordsworth as I have, uh, I am always struck afresh by the lofty uh, sense that his poetry uh, is capable of conveying and which he was able to impress upon his age even when his age did not necessarily agree or uh, promote the particular doctrine that Wordsworth propagated. Uh, and in particular, what uh, Wordsworth, it seems to me, does, and this is particularly well represented in the uh, two-part excursion, which is the earlier version of the poem that we will look in its uh, final authorized version, uh, published in 1850, but the, in its early beginnings, uh, in the so-called two-part prelude, which was published many uh, decades, in fact, a century after uh, the original, uh, we can already note the habit of Wordsworth, or the, one of the distinctive features of his poetry, uh, in the active poetic mind uh, grasping uh, a dis uh, and describing a scene and then immediately um, moving towards a reflection on that same uh, scene, uh, almost as if the action of describing and the reflection upon that description, the meditation, the external and the internal are two sides of the same coin. And this is one of the uh, prominent features of Wordsworth's poetry, in addition to the great passion and uh, the depth that he seems to think is connected with that experience. So the experiences that Wordsworth uh, describes are not simply the subjectivism, which we rather carelessly could describe him as having, but more uh, uh, an extended meditation. There is a sort of a visionary uh, aspect to Wordsworth's poetry that is almost religion, and certainly religious. And when he is at his best, there is no poet more swelling or stately in his phrasing than Wordsworth is. So whenever I pick up a Wordsworth poem, uh, it is not long. Uh, it, in fact, it takes very little time to realize who the author is precisely because of this characteristic uh, style that he has. And not just the style, but the power of the style, which remains undimmed uh, in my opinion. Now, for that style, let me just say a few things about this before uh, we do get to the poem. Uh, I want to provide it by way of introduction to Wordsworth, but also to some degree uh, the romantic epic, because it is clear to me that however much the other poets that we will look at uh, deviate from Wordsworth's style and even his vision. So, for example, Byron is far more uh, influenced by writers like Pope, uh, more willing to write in rhyming couplets, for instance, uh, than, than Wordsworth. However much Byron deviates from that, uh, the Wordsworthian norm, uh, nonetheless, Wordsworth's great poetic endeavor does uh, stamp his mind and his style on his contemporaries. Um, when one reads Wordsworth, one does hear echoes of Milton without a doubt, his blank verse, and uh, among other things, but also the stamp of Wordsworth. 
however much they may dislike the later Wordsworth, the Wordsworth of the uh, prelude uh, in its 1850 version, the conservative Wordsworth, the establishment Wordsworth, the, the Wordsworth that uh, received an honorary doctorate to uh, thunderous applause in the 1830s. Uh, I believe it was uh, 1839. Uh, and it just over and over the thunderous applause that Wordsworth had received by this point in his life uh, at the age of, uh, let me see here, 30, 69. So the old man Wordsworth, who'd born in 1870, um, however much he had become the establishment figure when he wrote in his early years, he was certainly uh, nothing of the sort. Uh, in fact, when he writes the two-part prelude, probably more influenced by the doctrines of the French Revolution than anything else. Uh, a revolution which took place when he was the age of 19. Uh, so when such uh, seismic events take place it, uh, at that uh, seminal period in one's life, it's hardly surprising that the poetry reflects that. And to my mind, it is, it is true that his poetic powers are best expressed when he is uh, less Christian uh, less conservative in his uh, views. Uh, the poetic power burns strongest at that age. Um, so let me say a few things about him here. I, I talked about influence. Uh, Milton is the most obvious type of influence insofar as he writes, even in the ver works that we will describe as being uh, epic. He is influenced by Milton's blank verse, um, as are many of the others but also by uh, poets of the 18th century that uh, we can see strong influences there. William Cooper, among others, the uh, Christian poet uh, and uh, a man whose uh, works are still sung uh, with great joy in Christian churches to this day, and Robert Burns. Uh, from these two men in the 18th century, he derives an, uh, a couple of things that we can note about Wordsworth. Um, which are not necessarily characteristic of a uh, verse of the 18th century, let alone the 19th century, uh, outside of the Romantic influence. Firstly, his realism. There is a, a, an attempt to unadorned present uh, life in its uh, smallness, not merely attending to matters that would have been, be of interest to the aristocracy and their subject matter, but even of children and, uh, and scenes. Uh, of the landscape and so forth. So that sort of realism is, is evident in Wordsworth's poetry. Also, he writes uh, in ballads, um, his most famous collection with Samuel Taylor Coleridge is uh, entitled The Lyrical Ballads. So a ballad, a song, uh, a popular type of song in particular. Uh, also the, the blank verse, which I described, which is uh, cannot be described anything other than Miltonic in its inspiration and origin. But above all, the technique that I described, the, 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 the descriptive slash meditative technique where he first describes a scene and then immediately um, uh, moves the subject of description to his uh, reflection upon it. And then with which he modifies the original description to talk about its lasting and powerful influence in, in terms that are almost religious in their expression. And, uh, and he's capable of doing this and they, they re become re remarkably vivid. And we will look at some of the most uh, influential ones here in the first uh, work that we will look at. Again, the uh, two-part prelude, which contains various spots of time, as Wordsworth calls them, that uh, he uh, also takes up in the longer version of the prelude, and which we can see, again, this characteristic, descriptive, meditative uh, approach. Uh, and he presents these uh, not merely as a technique, but almost as a religious exercise. The, he seems to ascribe uh, them as having fundamental importance in the development of his, his own person and his own character. Uh, and, and so he invites us to do likewise in our own uh, engagement with the world and thereby to um, cherish life and take joy from it. Uh, I want to say three things that are characteristic about Wordsworth here and Wordsworth's beliefs, uh, which constitute in some ways their claim uh, to be epic 
And in saying that, um, I want to say something about the epic uh, and its features. And epic is a long narrative poem, involves a hero, encyclopedic in its scope, uh, often will tell us about matters that uh, transcend that of a normal um, uh, realism, as we would call it. So they they deal with matters of the underworld and with the uh, uh, with the uh, existence and the affairs of the gods. So there's a council of the gods. There's a descent to the underworld. There's usually an invocation of a muse. Uh, we will see these sorts of features here, even in the uh, Wordsworth's own uh, poetry. Um, and also, uh, above all, um, the uh, lofty sense of the uh, poet's uh, uh, narrative and its significance. It is. It has a quasi-religious uh, state. Whether we find it in in Homer's work, which was sung and celebrated throughout all of Greece for millennia or whether it is uh, in Virgil's Aeneid, which was is a uh, an epic that celebrates the empire of Rome, um, wh or whether we see it in Dante's uh, grand uh, comedy, uh, which describes his Inferno and Purgatorium Paradiso, namely the journey of the Christian life in epic terms, or whether it's Milton's own Paradise Lost, which recasts the model of heroism away from earthly battles and their uh, and the victories that come thereby and the, uh, the national consequences and casts it rather in terms of the fall of mankind and is its restoration by God with the promise of a Messiah to come who will restore uh, the ruins of our first parents. Uh, that's Milton's inversion of the theme. And with that, he does something with the epic, which is uh, as I say, profound and influential upon later writers, particularly Wordsworth. So Milton internalizes the epic, makes the uh, uh, the battles, the chief battles to be won, not those against uh, flesh and blood, but rather against uh, the enemy uh, in accordance with uh, Ephesians 6. Uh, the enemies of Christians are not other people, but rather with the devil and with the principalities and, and powers, and they must be resisted and can be resisted by faith in Jesus Christ, whose shed blood uh, covers the believer, and uh, by faith in him, his victory over, over death and his resurrection from it and ascension to the right hand of God are those for the believer to grasp onto. And so Milton presents uh, the victories of the epic in Christian terms, uh, Wordsworth and his contemporaries carry on in that vein insofar as they no longer described uh, battles of, uh, of against uh, physical enemies. Uh, this is not, although the context is the French Revolution, we don't see the enemies as um, the aristocracy per se, let alone the king or the clergy. Uh, in in mind with the F French revolutionaries uh, were often intensely anti-clerical. We don't see that in the same way in the poetry of the English Romantic poets. Their enemies are more against uh, ideas and concepts uh, and fixities, so it's more of an intellectual epic. Uh, so more in keeping with Milton's uh, move towards a, a, a theolo theologizing of the epic and its subject matter. Uh, for the Romantic poets, it becomes certain doctrines which are presented. And there are three things that I think are characteristic of Wordsworth's uh, beliefs that are not just characteristic of Wordsworth, but have a lasting influence uh, that will endure throughout the 19th century and probably uh, at that point, and uh, at least when the First World War comes about. But these three things are the doctrine of nature that Wordsworth propounds, which is uh, which we still hold on to in our understanding of the word nature. And just as an aside here, if you're interested in the subject of conceptual change, I commend to you uh, C.S. Lewis's work, Studies in Words, I believe the second uh, the second entry that he looks at in great detail is the word nature, and he 
follows how the word nature is used uh, from its classical origins all the way up to the contemporary. And he ends with Wordsworth's romantic understanding of nature as a semi divine and total concept, a doc an understanding of a, of a pure uh, entity which we want to return back to, uh, such that we now think that if a food is natural, it is ipso facto good. Uh, this view of nature, which Wordsworth bequeaths to us, is not uh, something that we find in foregoing authors. It's not a biblical concept. Uh, it, it's not creation. Um, it's an creation which has uh, connotations of goodness and its origins, but also a sense of fallenness after Adam and Eve. Uh, it, it, it contains that this sense of purity and innocence and goodness, which is a, a romantic legacy. So have a look at Wordsworth's study or uh, Lewis's study in words if you're interested. I, I said three things of influence. So that his doctrine of nature. Secondly, his emphasis on the imagination. Uh, Wordsworth for Wordsworth and for some when they come to define the word uh, imagination um, they see it as the watchword of the Romantic era so in definitions of, of Romanticism this is often the, the key term imagination is the term that the poets of the age however much they differ in their beliefs and in their um, affiliation to one another all of them latch on to this word imagination uh, and then finally, uh, I think Wordsworth's, and this, and this is where Wordsworth is in his um, most influential, Wordsworth pre presents uh, a claim that there is a true source of human joy to be found in the descriptive meditative exercise that he himself offers to us. Uh, and with this, he presents himself as either a portico to Christianity, as a beginning, as a sort of a spilled religion, as uh, C.S. Lewis saw it, and and I, I have to say here, one, uh, however much one can see Wordsworth in his earliest origins as presenting a rival to Christianity, this was not how he was received in his own day, and uh, and and also that's not where he ends up. He ends up uh, adhering to something like uh, Christian orthodoxy later on in his life, which is a, a uh, which is the source of a great deal of dissatisfaction from his younger contemporaries, namely uh, Byron and Shelley and Keats, who look upon the the elder Wordsworth with a great deal of disdain for having betrayed his early convictions, convictions that they themselves held and and held to the end, and not just in terms of. Uh, politics, but even in terms of uh, adherence to Christianity. But uh, uh, Lewis sees uh, Wordsworth as a, um, a luminary figure in some ways. He's one of C.S. Lewis's fa favorite authors. And in fact, his autobiography, his second attempt at a sort of autobiography, Surprised by Joy, is a direct quote from uh, Wordsworth's uh, little poem uh, of the same name, but but Lewis sees Romanticism as a sort of spilled religion, as a uh, uh, something that has a uh, a trail of bright drops uh, on the floor that lead us towards ultimate joy, to towards what Lewis calls the weight of glory. Uh, we can see echoes of that in Wordsworth, and so it it's not. Uh, it's not the case that we cannot read and enjoy Wordsworth, as I think Lewis did, um, as a religious poet, without at the same time thinking that, particularly in his early work, that he really is expressing Christianity. But he is nonetheless seeing joy in the world around us and seeing it as the venue of God's uh, interaction. But I'm not going to say that uh, this poem that we're looking at today, the, the two-part prelude, is anything like orthodox in its Christian sense in its presentation. And we don't need to um, believe, as Wordsworth, Wordsworth would seemingly have us believe, that um, um, what Wordsworth is describing is something that everyone who reads him believes is happening. Um, 
that uh, when he presents a, a scene and then he describes the meditation upon the scene, that we will also follow the same subject matter and come to the same conclusion. And his readers don't do that either. Um, and yet, nonetheless, as I say, he is profoundly influenced and the great figure in the 19th century uh, as a poet and as a man uh, and, the, and the metal of his mind and the expression of his mind uh, dominate to the extent that, he, that uh, uh, Arnold, the, the great critic, still regards Wordsworth as, uh, the, uh, as a heroic and great poet as little as he will adhere to Wordsworth's metaphysical speculations, he still thinks that there's something profound and great about Wordsworth. And so what we need to do briefly is just to step back uh, a little bit and maybe try to understand why Wordsworth was received with such uh, almost religious fervor by the 19th century, while still noting uh, that it isn't, it isn't a return to orthodoxy per se, or let alone Christianity. Nonetheless, a sort of religiosity is present there in the 19th century, which uh, is as much as anything to be uh, credited to Wordsworth. So what is this? Um, it's not just a use of vivid language. It's not just uh, the prophetic tones of his images. It's the, her, uh, the historical circumstances of the day. And what are these in brief? Well, largely in the 18th century, uh, philosophy, natural philosophy, as it was called at the time, had become highly mechanistic in its understanding of the world. Whether we want to look at uh, the psychological uh, presentation of these views by uh, David Hartley, after whom Coleridge named one of his sons, um, or any of the other 18th century uh, philosophers, they, they tended to describe the way the world worked, the way in which physics worked in Newtonian mechanistic fashion. So the world was a machine, and not just the world being a machine, a disenchanted machine in which there was no more mystery, in which there was no more joy, in which there was no more uh, meaning, there was simply an interaction of inanimate uh, objects acting in, a, as I say, this mechanistic fashion, a philosophy which robbed life of all of its mystery and, quite frankly, all of its uh, religious sense. And it's Wordsworth's uh, signal accomplishment that he recaptured the sense of there being something more to life than mere physical or chemical or however you want to put it, abstract uh, and inhumane interactions. So we are not merely uh, selfish genes, to use Richard Dawkins' phrase. Um, there's something in us which is ethereal and uh, uh, profound uh, that, uh, it, that evades the sci scientist's attempt to reduce us to mere mechanical or chemical uh, exercises. And so what, word, what Wordsworth presents in his poetry is an experiential sense that there is a moral and aesthetic nature to man that the scientist has missed. And because of that, he was read with fervor, and Coleridge in his biographia says, the greatest of further amongst the young and particularly those who are spiritually minded. And so he exercised a profound influenced on the Victorian church. And there are books that are have been written on this subject and you may find them interesting. But of course, Wordsworth's sense of God is not God, the God, the triune God of scripture, the God outside and above nature. For Wordsworth, the God that he finds is the one of the spilt religion, namely in the presence of nature, almost as an part of the object of nature. Um, and I don't want to reduce Wordsworth to some sort of, of paganism where he thinks that nature is God. He, he doesn't do that. Um, he suggests simultaneously that God is remote and um, deserves our awe because he's not there in the landscape, while at the same time that he's omnipresent. And so there's a sense in Wordsworth and his uh, po poetic presentation that God is... Um, in the essence of things. So there's a panentheism 
in Wordsworth. And I do think it's it's heretical in its expression if we were to take it at its um, uh, at its word. It 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 cannot be seen otherwise than uh, uh, at odds with Christian uh, truth. Nonetheless, we can receive it as as Lewis did at any rate as a sort of a spilt religion, as the bright droplets on the ground that give evidence of something more than the merely mechanical uh, view of life, which the modern scientist post-Enlightenment, post-Newton tends to understand. And for that reason, I think Wordsworth remains a spiritual writer, if not uh, a Christian writer at his uh, most powerful. Um, what shall I say here? Um, yeah, one final thing. Um, as I said uh, a little earlier, his greatest admirer was his great friend, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, the definitive uh, work on Wordsworth and um, his accomplishment is Coleridge's Biographia Literaria, uh, the second half in particular. Uh, the Biographia Literaria, we're not going to read it in this course, um, is our sketches of uh, Coleridge's own literary life. And among other things, in that work, he will seek to differentiate his views from Wordsworth's views, because one of the things that is going to be a, um, at issue for Coleridge is precisely Wordsworth's paganism or at least if one takes him at his words and his and the words which are unambiguous, one cannot agree, says Coleridge, with Wordsworth's expression of them, and in particular, his understanding of the imagination, which Wordsworth, or rather Coleridge, regarded as his own concept and which he did not like Mr. Wordsworth uh, appropriating for himself and presenting his view of the imagination as if it were the view of the imagination. Coleridge thought that he could do better, and indeed I think he does do so in uh, book chapter uh, 13 uh, of the Biographia Literaria. He gives the, the definition of the primary and the secondary imagination. If you're interested in that subject, I have a lecture in the History of Lit Theory, which is on my YouTube page. But uh, Wordsworth does claim to the imagination, and, Words and Coleridge being critical of that, nonetheless, uh, particularly towards the end, say chapter 22, you'll find it maybe at its best. He praises Wordsworth for an amplitude of mind and a power in his poetry and a deeply felt moral concern that the reader cannot help but share uh, that he sees as, as, as I say, comprehensive, um, thoroughly sane, and, uh, and, and central to human interest. And for that reason, he thinks that Wordsworth is the greatest English poet since Milton. That's explicitly what, what uh, Coleridge says. And by this point, Coleridge uh, had fallen out to some degree with Wordsworth. They'd been reconciled, but they were never uh, on the friendly terms with which they began their life and worked together for, for a decade. Um, and, uh, and he puts uh, Wordsworth only after Milton and Shakespeare. And, and Coleridge's view here, I think, has remained uh, with some probably questioning, but I, to my mind, I've not yet read an English scholar that has replaced Wordsworth with another writer. Or if they have, there isn't a consensus as such. And so this understanding of Wordsworth as the great writer after uh, Shakespeare and Milton is still, to my mind, an understanding the uh, critical consensus, even if one does not rank writers today the way one once did. And in fact, the Academy seems uh, almost utterly opposed to any sense of a hierarchy of poets. I happen to think that there ought to be and that the hierarchy remains whether the Academy recognizes it or not. There's simply a greatness in Shakespeare, in Milton, and now also in Wordsworth, which means all three authors ought to be read and read uh, with, uh, with joy. And there is good reason for that. Um, but as I say, Matthew Arnold echoes this view, uh, the Victorian critic. And uh, Arnold's, uh, Arnold's influence is vast in the uh, contemporary modern uh, university, not just in uh, England, but also in the United States, where he 
toured at one point. Uh, the less appreciative tone, uh, one which I think has uh, considerable uh, weight, is that of his contemporary William Hazlitt. Now, Hazlitt was more uh, of a political radical. He uh, So his criticism of Wordsworth probably needs to have that in mind, uh, that there is a political uh, disagreement between the two men. But I think the criticism is actually fair uh, that, first of all, there is an unreality about Wordsworth's view of uh, the relation of man to the cosmos. Um, I would happen to share that view, but I do so because of uh, out of Christian conviction. Hazlitt uh, does so for other reasons. That probably remains controversial. Some probably still to this day regard Wordsworth's uh, view on the relation of mankind to the cosmos, this panentheism that I described as being uh, attractive and appealing and not being uh, absurd. Um, I happen to think it is absurd, and I think C.S. Lewis pro provides a good uh, antidote to that. If you look at mere Christianity, he deals exactly with pantheism uh, in largely Hegel, but he could have added Wordsworth into that uh, at the outset there and demonstrates, I think, why it simply cannot be held seriously as a philosophical position. Nonetheless, it is widely held. So that, that's the first critique. He says that there's an unreality uh, and a really a deluded optimism about how wonderful life is and how married the mind is to the natural world. That's Wordsworth's conviction. Hazlitt says it's nonsense. Uh, but secondly, he says that there's an egotism in his poetry, uh, and the egotism is that he uses the natural objects that he begins his description with to a meditation upon his own mind, which Hazlitt says is more mo motivated by egotism than it is by uh, any true religious fervor. I think this is slightly harsh, but there is something in it, and, and uh, uh, John Keats, with whom we will finish the course with his own uh, take on the romantic epic, uh, echoes this in his letters. He speaks of the about the egotistical sublime uh, in speaking of Wordsworth's uh, poetry, and I think there is something there in that. So this meditative, this descriptive meditative technique is a, a vehicle for Wordsworth's egotism, according to Hazlitt. Whether Hazlitt is being fair to the man or not, you can certainly see why uh, one might say that the natural landscape, which we're going to now look at in Wordsworth's uh, depiction here, is really just a vehicle for Wordsworth to talk about himself. And with that, I do want to say that this uh, this tendency of on Wordsworth's uh, behalf of beginning with an external description and then moving towards what he really wants to talk about himself, namely, becomes characteristic of modernist poetry. Um, which I have very little taste for, and I think is has is a profoundly uh, troublesome turn. But it's also the psychological turn uh, that A. C. Bradley, amongst other things, defends in his uh, Oxford lectures on poetry. He sees Wordsworth as a visionary, and he reads uh, Shakespeare uh, likewise as uh, his chief um, accomplishment as a poet is the psychological realism that he presents in in his works. Uh, whatever one thinks of Bradley's critique here in his lectures on poetry and his lectures on Shakespeare, there's no doubt that the psychological aspect of Wordsworth's poetry and even of Shakespeare's uh, writing uh, needs to be noticed and given uh, credence to and attention to at any rate. But with all that said, and I've spent half an hour now in introducing here, let me get to the two-part prelude. I want to spend the rest of my time on that and uh, and say a few things about it. And I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail because we are going to actually, as I said, over the course of four lectures, look at the prelude in its 1850 version, uh, which will amplify really many of the scenes described in the two-part prelude are picked up again in the longer version of that work. And I would say he adds more of the epic machinery to it that we uh, than we see here in the two-part prelude. But some of the episodes and the characteristic bent of mind, the tendency uh, that I described towards the imagination and so forth, we can find them here in the two-part prelude. So let me have a look at some of that now. And I'll, I'll, I'll read some extracts from it 
and I'm going to effectively give something like a close reading. Um, I'll, I'll read an extract, I'll make some comments, I'll move on. For those who are perhaps reading it uh, on their own, I will try and give uh, line numbers. So book one and then line and so forth. So let me begin with the first lines of the poem. Uh, was it for this that one, the fairest of all rivers, loved to blend his murmurs with my nurse's song? And from his alder shades and rocky falls, and from his fords and shallows, sent a voice that flowed along my dreams? For this didst thou, O Derwent, traveling over the green plains near my sweet birthplace, didst thou, beauteous stream, make ceaseless music through the night and day, which with its steady cadence tempering our human waywardness, composed my thoughts to more than infant softness, giving me among the fretful dwellings of mankind a knowledge a dim earnest of the calm which nature breathes along the fields and groves. It's a question mark that punctuates the conclusion of that passage in line uh, 15 or 16. He begins with a long phrase. It's a long question. Was it for this? And once again, for this didst thou. Now he speaks of the Derwent, the river that flows uh, through his native Cumbria, where Wordsworth was born. And if you want to look at a map of England, you'll notice in the northwest, the utter northwest, utmost northwest, is what words, what we will now call the Lake District, uh, a period, uh, uh, an area of uh, England which to this very day is uh, little populated and is now effectively a national park, um, an area of the, of the uh, country which has been to some degree uh, dedicated to the preservation of the natural world, the natural world that Wordsworth himself celebrated. And I should also say that Wordsworth's sense of the holiness of nature in his landscape has been preserved by this sense of calling this a, na a national park. Uh, he began the movement which we uh, have held on to certainly here in my own country of Canada, but also in other countries around the world, places where uh, humans will not inhabit, and there will be a sense of seeking to preserve that landscape. Um, so once again, the, the 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 vast influence of Wordsworth and his poetry is can be seen in things as seemingly unrelated as the growth of national parks and the sentiment that in the presence of nature, one does not want to see the presence of man. Uh, and that ought to be preserved as a human legacy. But he asks the river, and he apotheosis, apotheosis. <laughs> there's an apotheosis in the uh, uh, phrase here, in, in speaking to it directly, and speaks to it as a thou as well, I must say. So in intimate terms, as, as a close intimate, was it for this that one, the fairest of all rivers, loved to blend his murmurs with my nurse's song. And then he says, and didst thou, O Derwent, traveling over these things. So he wants to know whether the, it was for him that these things happened and that you worked quietly blending your murmurs, the, the noises that the, 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 the quiet stream made trickling through the landscape with his nurse's song, this, the, this quiet ways that, that you lent, sent a voice that flowed through my dreams. So note again that right at the outset, before he even moves onward to what he will call spots of time, he talks about the influence of the external world in developing uh, his internal self and uh, gives him, as he puts it, a knowledge, a dim earnest of the calm which nature breathes among the fields and, and groves. Um, what he then follows with is a description, and it is roughly chronological, going from the age of, of four here at the outset in line uh, 17 to the conclusion in uh, of, uh, book two, uh, the age of 17, so 
before he goes away to university, he will describe these the influence of the natural landscape and his upbringing on the man who will then go into uh, Cambridge and study and find himself unwilling to submit to the way in which knowledge is presented to him there in the institution which, which Isaac Newton had made so famous. There's a resistance among the man, the natural uh, worshiper Wordsworth to the mech mechanistic view of life that uh, Newton's uh, great scientific endeavor had established at that point. But was it for this? And it was it for this, he repeats once again, for the third time, that I, a four years child, a naked boy among thy silent pools made one long bathing of a summer's day, basked in the sun, or plunged into thy streams alternate all a summer's day, or coursed over the uh, sandy fields and dashed the flowers of yellow grunsel, of, or whom crag and hill, or the woods and distant skiddaws, lofty height, it's a mountain in the Lake District, lofty height were bronzed with a deep radiance, stood alone, a naked savage in the thunder shower and afterwards, etc. Was it for this, or was it for this, and was it for this, uh, this technique uh, of, of, of repetition uh, and, and the inter interrogatio uh, phrase here? So poetic devices uh, asking questions to the landscape, a landscape which does not speak for itself, but, but which he will speak for. He's almost speaking on behalf of nature and how it speaks and informs him. He says it was early on when he stood alone uh, on, and later on a mountain scope, he says, it, escape, he, he said, "'Twas my joy, line 30, to wander half the night among the cliffs and the smooth hollows where the woodcocks ran among the moonlight turf." And what did he do at this point? He destroyed them. Uh, what we will find uh, in these uh, descriptive phrases, which the, he then meditates on, are episodes in his early life which the elder Wordsworth regards as immoral actions. They are the most influential in some ways. And, and it, there's an early um, awareness, which again, C.S. Lewis describes in Mere Christianity as a sense of injustice, a, na an, a native sense of justice and injustice, which he knows that he is transgressing in his actions, even as a boy. And it's the very awareness of an immoral action, which, which brings him to be fearful for what he's done. And nature in himself, itself, condemns him in some ways. And this interaction back and forth, so he's not being pulled up by the authorities. He's, there's no uh, police officer apprehending him. It's his own conscience that is convicting him uh, that what he has done is wrong. And nonetheless, that conviction, the quiet way in which nature works, he says, forms a, a sense of moral integrity, which he regards as not something that is simply a subjective or a religious imposition. It's something that comes with being a human being. We know what is right and wrong even as, as a young man. And so here he goes where the woodcocks ran and he destroys them. And, and going from snares, now he's talking about where, where fowlers go and place traps in order to catch birds because this is a very poor area of, of, uh, of England and there are hunters there trying to catch birds for food. And he is going there, scudding from snare to snare, line one, line 37, I plied my anxious visitation, hurrying on, still hurrying, hurrying onward, how my heart panted among the scattered yew trees and the crags that looked upon me, how my bosom beat with expectation. Sometimes, he says, strong desire, resistless, overpowered me, and the bird, which was the captive of another's toils, became my prey. And when the deed was done, I heard among the solitary hills, low breathings coming after me and sounds of undistinguishable motion, steps almost as silent as the turf they trod, nor less in springtime when on southern banks the shining sun had from his knot of leaves decoyed 
the primrose flower, and when the vales and woods were warm, was I a rover then in the high places, on the longsome peaks, among the mountains and the winds? Though mean and though inglorious were my views, then end was ignoble. Oh, when I have hung above the raven's nest, so now he's snatching eggs, hanging over the cliff, and he's being blown about, hanging by knots of grass on half-inch fissures in the slippery rock, but ill-sustained, and almost as it seemed suspended by the blast which blew amain, shouldering the naked crag. Oh, at that time, while on the perilous ridge I hung alone, with what strange utterance did the loud, dry wind blow my through my ears? The sky seemed not a sky of earth, and with a, what motion moved the clouds? So there's a sense of divinity of a divinity that is judging him for his actions and nonetheless being present uh, there even in the midst of his uh, seemingly solitary actions in the natural world and he he reflects on this and states that the mind of man line uh, 67 is fashioned and built up even as strain of music i believe that there are spirits which when they would form a favored being from his very dawn of infancy do open out the clouds as at the touch of lightning, seeking him with gentle visitation. Quiet powers, retired and seldom recognized, yet kind, and to the very meanest, not unknown. With me, though rarely, in my early days they communed. Others too, there are who are who use, yet haply aiming at the self-same end, severer interventions, ministry more palpable, and of their school was I. What he's describing here is his particular sensitivity to the world around him. There are certain types of people, and Wordsworth will describe the poetic mindset in his uh, introduction to pre his preface to the lyrical ballads. He'll talk about the character of the poet as a, ma a mind who is more sensitive to the world around him, more aware of his own feelings, and more reflective upon that, he says, is a characteristic of the poet. And of such, he says, and of their school uh, was I. So that's line... Uh, uh, 80 there about uh, so he's described already the the theft of the uh, fowler's traps of eggs uh, he feels the 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 he hears the breathings of nature coming after him uh, presumably in his own mind uh, out of a sense of guilt coming to apprehend him. Then he feels the strong wind which is pushing him up while he's leaning over the edge and could fall to his death. Um, and then he will reflect on how this 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 uh, working of nature comes to develop the mind of man, chiefly those like him who are of the poetic cast of mind. They, these are powers. He then moves on to a second uh, spot of time. He doesn't describe it as a spot of time yet. That happens in uh, line uh, around line 290. He uses that famous phrase. But this is another spot of time, uh, line 81. Uh, and I'll read the, uh, this extract here. He says, uh, these spirits guided me one evening, led by them, I went alone into a shepherd's boat. So he's stolen the boat, a skiff that to a willow tree was tied within a rocky cave, its usual home. The moon was up. The lake was shining clear among the hoary mountains from the shore. I pushed and struck the oars and struck again in cadence. And my little boat moved on just like a man who walks with stately step, though bent on speed. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Not without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they mounted all, melted all into one track of sparkling light. If you've ever rode on uh, moonlit water, you'll know what he's describing here. The trails where the uh, blades of the oars have first fallen into the water and then moved away, and the track of the this uh, left in the water. A rocky steep uprose above the cavern of the willow tree, and now 
As suited one who proudly rode up with his best skill, I fixed a steady view upon the top of that same craggy ridge. So if you, one can imagine oneself in, uh, in a, on a, a water, in this case, a small lake, uh, and remember that he, he rode out of a cave so that it was sufficiently high, the, the uh, cave in which he was in, to be up, off the ground and for him to enter it. So he, while he's close to the cave, he can see nothing but the cave. As he moves away from the cave further and further distance, he gets away from the bank of the lake and starts to see something else. And you have to imagine this here. He says... Uh, he fixed a steady view upon the top of that same craggy ridge, line 100, the bound of the horizon, for behind was nothing but the stars and the gray sky. Ah, but that's not for long. As he rose further and further away, something else will emerge. She was an elfin pinnace. Twenty times I dipped my oars into the silent lake. And as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When, from behind that rocky steep, till then the bound of the horizon, a huge cliff, as if voluntary power instinct, upreared its head. I struck and struck again. So as he moves away from the edge of the bank and comes further, what was up to that point because of the angle hidden from him is this huge mountain. And the further he gets away from the shore, the higher this mountain will grow, such that it looks like the mountain is coming after him. So it's a, an optical illusion. The mountain was there all the time. At first he couldn't see it. Now he can see it. He, he says, uh, it came, this huge cliff rose up between me and the starts, and still with measured motion, like a living thing, strode after me. With trembling hands I turned, and through the silent water stole my way back to the cavern of the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark, and through the meadows homeward went with grave and serious thoughts. And after I had seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being. In my thoughts there was darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion, no familiar objects, of hourly objects, images of trees, of sea or sky, no colors of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through my mind by day and were the trouble of my dreams. So what uh, arises out of this passage in which he has stolen a boat and in which he has had the optical illusion which uh, of, of, a, of a cliff coming after him as if nature were hunting him down for his transgression, it leads him to a sense of something present in nature which is greater than simply the natural world, the physical natural world, a, a, a supernatural sense, a metaphysical sense. And he says this now, he says, Ah, not in vain, ye beings of the hills, he capitalizes the word be here, and ye that walk the woods and open heaths by moon or starlight. Thus from my first dawn of childhood did ye love to intertwine the passions that build up our human soul, not with the mean and vulgar works of man, but with high objects, with eternal things, with life and nature, purifying thus the elements of feeling and of thought and sanctifying by such discipline both pain and fear until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart. Now note where this leads him. It, it leads him first of all from the little moment in his life when he transgressed and did something which is against the law of God, namely to steal. He is aware of this. Wordsworth would have been taught in the uh, churches on Sunday and in his schooling. He would have understood uh, Christian doctrine. He makes no reference to it here uh, as such, but he knows that what he has done is wrong. And the experience of the wrongness wasn't just a conviction of his own heart. It was um, 
uh, emphasized by the experience he had in nature of certain things happening. In this case, he uh, initially he heard the breathings coming after him, and uh, but in this case, he saw the mountain or the cliff seemingly pursuing him. And with all of that, he has a sense that there is a moral power in the natural world, which is as real as the moral sense that he has within him, his own breast. And this is very interesting, and it really leads him to reflect on and leads him to the conclusion that it is actually our own capacity for moral feelings which creates that sense of the landscape. And this is where this is all going. It's not that there's a moral, uh, or it's as much in within him as it is out there. And it's unclear in Wordsworth's uh, formulation wherein this moral sense comes. Does it come from uh, from God and from without, as it were, or does it originate in the human heart? Wordsworth inclines towards the latter, the moral feelings. But what is not uh, in any doubt for Wordsworth is that the feelings that he has of a moral objective and beautiful nature that is out there um, is true for all, all who attend to their own feelings. And herein is the religious um, uh, achievement of Wordsworth, is to talk about what, what, again, as I say, referring back to Lewis, perhaps too much here in his mere Christianity, recognizes as this innate sense of, of morality, which characterizes, quite frankly, all religions. There's simply an awareness that there is a moral right and wrong. And we hold to it and believe when somebody transgresses it that they've done something wrong. Not just that we don't like it, but there is an objective moral wrong, uh, wrongness to it. And Wordsworth himself describes it here, developing in himself in the presence of nature. And so he says, it sanctified by such discipline both pain and fear until we recognize a grandeur in the beatings of the heart. And he says, nor was this fellowship vouchsafed to me with stinted kindness. It comes once again. Uh, and he will talk then about, and I'm going to skip over this because I I'm, uh, will run out of time if I don't move on with some alacrity here. He talks about uh, an episode of skating and the sound in the hills that are around there. Uh, he will talk about, um, in line uh, 215, I have my notes here, uh, he will talk about um, a game of cards, uh, so simple occupations in the rural landscape. Um, um, and then finally, I'm going to want to pick it up here, line 255. Uh, the grateful acknowledgement, uh, 250. It were a song venial, he says, and such as if I rightly judge, I might protract unblamed. But I perceive, he says, that much is overlooked, and we should ill attain our object if from delicate fears of breaking in upon the unity of this, my argument, I should omit to speak of such effects as cannot here be regularly classed, yet tend no less to the same point, the growth of mental power and love of nature's works. So I want you to underline those words. The same point is being emphasized throughout all these things. As one matures in years, in the presence of nature, there is a growth of mental power. He's not describing it to his education in schools. The school here is the book of nature. And what comes from that schooling or growth of mental power is a love of nature. And from that, he'll describe in the 1850 version, he moves from the love of nature to the love of mankind. But now he's eight. So he began at the age of four, and now he's he says, ere I had seen eight summers, and twas in the very week when I was first transplanted to thy vale, beloved Hawkshead, when thy paths, thy shores, and brooks were like a dream of novelty to my half-infant, I chanced to cross one of those open fields, which, shaped like ears, make green peninsulas on Esthwaite's lake. These are all sites in the Lake District that are being capitalized here. And he happens to come across uh, something that also strikes him. And what is it? It's uh, the drowning of a young man, uh, of a man. He, find, he comes across uh, a heap of garments, line 271, as if left by one who were there bathing. Half an hour I watched, and no one owned them. Meanwhile, the calm lake grew dark with all the shadows on its breast. 
and now and then a leaping fish disturbed the breathing stillness. The succeeding day there came a company, and in their boat sounded with iron hooks they're going down trying to fish the body, and with long poles. At length the dead man, mid that beauteous scene of trees and hills and water, bolt upright, rose with his ghastly face. So again, a scene of uh, that one never forgets, a dead body, and the horror of that. He will talk about those sorts of instances repeatedly. He's going to come to one that's probably even more influential in a moment. I'll get to that in two seconds, but let me look to his reflection on this descriptive scene. Remember the, the description and then the meditation. Here's the meditation. I might advert to numerous accidents in flood or field, quarry or moor or mid the winter snows, distresses and disasters, tragic facts of rural history that impressed my mind with images, to which in following years far other feelings were attached with forms that yet exist, with independent life, and like their archetypes, no, no decay. So now he's talking about, and again, in terms of types and archetypes, his individual experiences with a moral significance are uh, as real and as objective and as universal as the archetypes uh, that we associate them. And he says, they know no decay. And then he gets to the famous phrase, there are in our existence spots of time, which with distinct preeminence retain a fructifying virtue the virtue that leads to a fruitfulness. Whence, depressed by trivial occupations and the round of ordinary intercourse, our minds, especially the imaginative, imaginative power, are nourished and invisibly repaired. Invisibly repaired. Such moments chiefly seem to have their date in our first childhood. I remember well. Tis of an early season that I speak, the twilight of a rememberable life, while I was yet an urchin who could scarce, um, uh, you're not going to, I'm not going to skip over this, it's too important. While I was scarce, um, uh, could hold a bridle with ambitious hopes, I mounted and we rode across the hills. We were a pair of horsemen. Honest James was with me, my encourager and guide. We had not traveled long ere some mischance disjoined me from my comrade. And through fear, dismounting, down the rough and stony moor I led my horse, and stumbling on at length came to a bottom, where in former times a man, the murderer of his wife, was hung in irons. Moldered was the gibbet mast, the bones were gone, the iron and the wood, only a long green ridge of turf remained, whose shape was like a grave. I left the spot and reascending the bare slope, I saw a naked pool that lay beneath the hills, the beacon on the summit, and more near a girl who bore a pitcher on her head and seemed with difficult steps to force her way against the blowing wind. Now, what does he see here? He sees a place where a man was hung for a murder uh, and, and and clapped in irons, but there's nothing left of that other than the um, the remembrance amongst the townsfolk that that's where the murderer was executed. And he sees and imagines a green grave on that. And moving from that scene in which a moral transgression had been punished and a man had been killed, he moves from that to see a woman be or a girl with a pitcher on her head being buffeted by the wind and the power of nature, which has erased the signs of that man's transgression and indeed of his life is now uh, evident in pushing this girl against the wind, the wind being so profound that it's pushing her and she can barely keep herself upright. And he says, it was in truth an ordinary sight, but I should need colors and words that are unknown to man to paint the visionary dreariness, which while I looked all round for my lost guide did at that time invest the naked pool, the beacon on the lonely eminence the woman and her garments vexed and tossed by the strong wind. So now the strong wind is the sign of this judging power and terrific moral power in nature. One final scene I will look at before I moved on, and this is a scene that 
one would have thought was even more prominent than it is, it's the death of his father. And now he's around the age of, he's not yet 10. Nor less I recollect, long after, though my childhood not, had not ceased, another scene which left a kindred power implanted in my mind. One Christmas time, the day before the holidays began, feverish and tired and restless, I went forth into the fields impatient for the sight of those three horses which should bear us home, my brothers and myself. There was a crag, an eminence which, from the meeting point of two highways, ascending overlooked at least a long half mile of those two roads, by each of which the expected steeds might come. The choice, uncertain. Thither I repaired up to the highest summit. Twas a day stormy and rough and wild, and on the grass I sat, half sheltered by a naked wall. Behind him. Upon my right hand was a single sheep, a whistling hawthorn on my left, and there, those two companions at my side, I watched with eyes intensely straining as the mist gave intermitting prospects of the wood and plain beneath. Ere I to school returned that dreary time, ere I had been ten days a dweller in my father's house, he died. And I and my two brothers, orphans then, followed his body to the grave. The event, with all the sorrow which it brought, appeared a chastisement. And when I called to mind that day so lately past, when from the crag I looked in such anxiety of hope, with trite reflections of morality, yet with the deepest passion I bowed low to God, who thus corrected my desires, and afterwards the wind and sleety rain and all the busyness of the elements, the single sheep and the one blasted tree and the bleak music of that old stone wall, the noise of wood and water and the mist which on the line of each of those two roads advanced in such indisputable shapes, all these were spectacles and sounds to which I often would repair, and thence would drink as at a fountain. And I do not doubt that in this later time when storm and rain beat on my roof at midnight, or by day when I am in the woods, unknown to me the workings of my spirit thence are brought. Nor sedulous to trace diligent how nature by collateral interest indirect and by extrinsic passion peopled first my mind with forms, and here when he uses the word forms, think really in platonic terms, or beautiful or grand, and made me love them. May I well forget how other pleasures have been mine in joys of subtler origin, how I have felt not seldom, even in that tempestuous time, those hallowed and pure motions of the sense, which seem in their simplicity to own an intellectual charm, that calm delight, which, if I err not, surely must belong to those firstborn affinities that fit our new existence to existing things and in our dawn of being constitute the bond of union betwixt life and joy. Yes, I remember when the changeful earth and twice five seasons on my mind had stamped the faces of the moving year. Even then, I, a child, I held unconscious intercourse with the eternal beauty, drinking in a pure organic pleasure from the lines of curling mist or from the level plane of waters colored by the steady clouds. So he is describing here how his heart was framed. If you want to see further on that, he actually uses such uh, language uh, quite explicitly in uh, what I believe I have erased here in my lines in the 450s and thereabout. Um, that it it creates a visible uh, scene. The visible scene creates an invis has an invisible effect, and the beauty and the joy of life is impressed upon him in a quiet way, which he cannot fully describe, although he seeks to. But which he knows more 
profoundly than anything external that has ever happened to him. These little spots, moments of time reflect, and they are types of the archetypes which pers persist throughout all generations. So I've uh, spent considerable time here uh, dealing with the uh, first book of the two-part prelude. I am going to run out of time to deal with the second part of that. I would draw your to your attention uh, one final verse, and this is our, uh, this is going to be well down in uh, book two of the prelude, and it's simply because of the lines being famous and important. Uh, line 440 in there, thereabouts, and I will read a, an extended passage here. When this is, he's now seven, 17. He says, um, well, I'll read it all the way from the uh, description of a 17th year to the one life he says is within us. So here it goes. He observes affinities where no brotherhood exists to common minds. My 17th year was come. And whether from this habit rooted now so deeply in my mind, <coughs> or from excess of the great social principle of life, coercing all th great things into sympathy, to un unorganic natures, I transferred my own enjoyments. Or the power of truth coming in revelation, I converse with things that really are. So the things that really are, are the things of nature that perdure uh, despite the work of man. The work of man he will repeatedly portray as being in ruin. So early on, and I didn't deal with this passage, but let's look at look, line 110, he describes an abbey which was constructed by monks and built to uh, last and such that the, the ruin is still there many centuries afterwards, but now with no roof on it, it's a sublime landscape in which nature has devastated it, and yet there's a sign of a presence that is absent, namely the nature itself. Its power is everywhere evident as being stronger and more vital and more uh, full of love than all of the other human uh, vestiges of life. And he goes on, he says, he saw, I at this time saw blessings spread around me like a sea. Thus did my days pass on. And now at length from nature and her overflowing soul, I had received so much that all my thoughts were steeped in feelings. I was only then contented when this bliss ineffable, I felt the sentiment of being spread or all that moves and all that seemeth still or all that lost beyond the ridge of thought and human knowledge, to the human eye invisible, yet liveth to the heart, or all that leaps and runs and shouts and sings, or beats the gladsome air, or all that glides beneath the wave, yea, in the wave itself and might depth of waters. Wonder not if such my transports were. For in all things I saw, underline this, one life, and felt that it was joy. One song they sang, and it was audible. Most audible, ten, when they flesh it, when the fleshy ear, or come by grosser prelude of that strain, forgot its functions and slept undisturbed. It was the loudest when it was silent. So Wordsworth, and this is characteristic of Wordsworth's poetry, he's drawing us further into the natural landscape, to the supernatural presence that he says is within the natural, observable Newtonian universe. And this, he says, is a greater reality that the scientist quite simply misses. And this also has a moral nature, which is as real as anything else can be discerned or believed or proved to be true. And this is the entire religious weight of Wordsworth's poetry, the weight that makes him the great influencer of the 19th century and one of the great poets of the English language. And I will leave it off there at this point, having given us an introduction to Wordsworth's work and to the romantic uh, epic in general in the two-part prelude, and I shall see you uh, next time. Thank you for that. See you soon.